It's time for us to check back in with the people and their quilts and see what John Rice talks about next. If you missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Album Block State Quilt. I acquired this quilt many years before I had any appreciable interest in the subject and before I maintained copious notes as to the origin and background on the items I bought. My information on this quilt is based on memory. It was purchased from Guy Bowers of Kingsport, Tennessee, who stated that the woman who made it was the daughter of a man from that area who had, in the era of the Wright brothers, invented an airplane. Guy also stated that the woman had traveled throughout the country and acquired a piece of material from all the then 48 states. The names of the states are appliqued by use of Lazy Daisy and French Knot Embroidery Stitching. It measures 107 inches by 80 inches. Nine Patch Quilt and the Quilt Protector when we were gathering quilts at the Museum of Appalachia to be photographed, we found this one in an old quilt chest in the General Bunch cabin. I remembered vividly when I bought this pine quilt chest 30 years previously. It sat on the front porch of the old log house where Kelly and Rufus Elledge lived in a narrow hollow in the Smoky Mountain section of Sevier County, Tennessee. Singer Dolly Parton and her family were their neighbors. The squares in the nine patch blocks are made of stripped, hand spun, and hand woven material. I feel sure that this fabric was made in the loom house located a few feet from the Elledge cabin. I bought numerous blankets, coverlets, and garments made of striped material similar to that found in the quilt. My assumption is that the quilt top was made from scraps of old dresses and petticoats. The other interesting and unusual feature about this quilt is the 10 inch wide protective covering which is fitted over one end of it on the right side as this is shown in the photograph. Although it appears not to have been a widespread addition, it is a most practical innovation. When the protective piece became soiled by dirty little fingers tucking it underneath the chins of small children or from grandpa's chin whiskers, then it could be removed easily, washed, and replaced, thereby eliminating the need to launder the entire quilt. This covering is made of cotton and has been basted to the quilt. This is the only quilt I have found with such a covering, and I've talked with only two people who were familiar with the practice. One was Mildred Locke, the well-known quilter from Bell Buckle, who is discussed in this book, and the other is Margaret Heaton, a native of Kansas. Margaret remembers both her mother and her grandmother using such strips to protect the quilts and also to protect chins from the rough textured heavy woolen quilts. Lawrence Stooksbury's Childhood Crazy Quilt. In 1896, when Lawrence Stooksbury was about five years old, the youngest of 14 children, his sister Pearl supervised the making of this family crazy quilt for him. The other sisters each made a block and signed their names, Hattie, Nola, Lily, Nanny, and Ethel. They decorated it throughout with floral designs and they added the phrases, home sweet home, gone home, the date, 1896, indicating the year it was started, and 1900, denoting the year in which it was finished. The girls had young Lawrence place his hand on one section and they traced around it with a pencil, then embroidered his handprint. Above this, they wrote in pencil, remember, but only the R was embroidered. It is not known why this part was left unfinished. Pearl was always sickly, and when she died of tuberculosis as a young unmarried woman, Lawrence came to treasure the quilt more than ever. He took it and cared for it all his life. His daughter Willie, who now owns the quilt, remembers how carefully her father guarded it through the years. He always kept it in a little green trunk, and we children were never allowed to look inside. Sometimes he'd get it out and show it to us and tell us about how his sisters made it, but even then we were not able to touch it. He always thought the world of that quilt, and he saw that it was took care of. On a very few special occasions, him and mother would use it as a bed cover, but very seldom. Unlike most of the Victorian crazy quilts, this one is made mostly from woolen scraps. It measures 72 inches by 64. Miss Teacher's Friendship Quilt 
A most unusual quilt making project came about in 1928 when some of Jeanette Norman's eighth grade students decided to make a quilt for her hope chest. Jeanette had only a high school education when she started teaching in the fall of 1927 in the coal mining town of Bryceville, Anderson County, Tennessee. Her monthly salary was $55. Jeanette served as a substitute teacher at Lake City Elementary School. There were 26 teachers in the school, and any time one of them was absent, she invariably requested that Miss Galloway be called as the substitute. She was friendly and vivacious, but in the classroom, she was all business. She once said, if a teacher has to do more than gently tap her pencil on the desk to get the student's attention, there is something wrong. She was strict, but she was loved by her students. Perhaps that's why those young girls in her first class wanted to do something special for her. One might think the ideal of making a quilt for the teacher was a ploy on the part of the students to avoid arithmetic and spelling. I asked Jeanette if she allowed the students to work on the quilt during school hours. Oh no, we set up a sewing club of the eighth grade and we met every two weeks in some of the homes, mostly in my home. I furnished some of the material and some of the mothers furnished some of it. Wool and scrap, it's all wool. There was 14 in the class, eight girls and six boys. Each girl had a square to make. Of course, the boys couldn't sew, but they wanted their names on the quilt so their sisters or their mothers would work on their squares. But the girls did their own sewing, I asked. Yes, eighth grade girls are quite capable. They could sew and many of those girls went on to become teachers. The names of those 14 children remain sewn in this quilt, which was made for Miss Teacher's Hope Chest. Clint Bailey was the one that started calling me Miss Teacher, and the others soon picked it up. They still call me that, the ones that's living. There's five of the 14 who are dead, including Clint. You knew him. He drove a school bus for you. Well, I married that feller, she pointed to her bedridden husband, William Galloway, on October 12, 1930. And on our golden wedding anniversary, I gave this quilt to Clint's two granddaughters. I always thought so much of him, and I knew the granddaughters too, so I gave it to them to keep as a sort of remembrance of their grandfather. The James Peter French Friendship Quilt, First Place Winner. In the fall of 1884, a group of young ladies in Salem Valley in South Knox County, Tennessee, joined together to make a friendship quilt for James Peter French. He was the youngest of the 13 children of Peter and Melinda Allison French, who had settled Salem Valley in 1812. In his mid-30s at the time, James was said to have known the Bible by heart and was an advanced craftsman, farmer, and musical instrument maker. From a prominent and respected family, he must have been one of the community's most eligible bachelors. As the girls spent many hours quilting together that fall, they wondered aloud who the lucky girl was who was destined to sleep under the quilt they were laboring over. The suspense ended the following April, 1885, when James Peter French married Millie Johnson, one of the girls who had prepared a square and whose initials appeared thereon. The quilt is now in the possession of Mrs. David Geneva Jennings of Powell, Tennessee, she is the daughter of Cora French Blazer, who was the daughter of James Peter and Millie French. Geneva, who is a librarian with the Knox County School System, entered her grandparents' quilt in the Museum of Appalachia Spring Quilt Show in 1983 and won first place in the category Quilts with the Most Interesting History. Sarah Aldridge's Tennessee Wildflower with Alabama Roots it was more than appropriate that Sarah Aldridge would choose to quilt the Tennessee wildflower pattern. She is an accredited flower show judge, has her own wildflower garden, and has intimate knowledge of wildflowers. Even so, when she started to embroidery these flowers, she took her threads to her wildflower garden in an endeavor to select just the right hue of thread for each flower. This quilt, which has the feathered wreath design quilted into the solid blocks, won second place in the Mixed Technique category at the Museum of Appalachia Quilt Show in March 1983. Sarah moved from Alabama as a girl to Oak Ridge, Tennessee in 1943. Only a few months after that, overnight Atomic City was founded. 
She has been quilting for only a few years, and I was curious as to what prompted her, a 40-year resident of a modern city, to take up quilting. At first, I did not get very definite answers. Then I asked about her mother in Lawrence County, Alabama, and the response to this question was more revealing. My father died and left my mother with nine children whose ages ranged from 16 months to 16 years. That was in the Depression, and even well-established families were going broke every day. But my mother was a good manager, and she paid her taxes and her farm payments to the Federal Land Grant Association first, whether there was any money left over or not. We raised cotton mostly, and it was hand-picked. We all worked hard, and Mother managed well. And she came out of the Depression with nine grown children and more property than when my father died. In the winter is when my mother did her quilting. She had a brother-in-law who had a dry-cleaning establishment, and he would give her the unclaimed clothes, and she would make them into everyday quilts. She went around the community helping to teach other women how to sew and make quilts. Mosey Sharp Beeler, 96, and her slave quilt, mother to 36 children. Big Valley is one of the most beautiful valleys in East Tennessee and was among the first to be settled. Starting in 1784, the Sharp family settled there in what is now Union County, an hour's drive north of Knoxville. There were very few slaves in this area, and during the Civil War, almost all of the people were either neutral or sympathetic to the North, but some of the larger landholders had a few household slaves, and the Sharp family, including Fletcher and Minerva Sharp, were among this group. They lived in a large, white-columned brick home, a mansion by Tennessee standards. One of their household slaves was a young black girl named Rachel Sharp, who was set free probably as a result of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863. Like many former slaves in that section of the valley, known as Sharp's Chapel, Rachel continued to live on the old Sharp place after she was freed. She married Tom Palmer and made this quilt for Sarah Sack Sharp, the mother of Mosey and the daughter of her former owner. Sack used the quilt a good bit, Mosey recalled, and upon her death in 1935, it fell to Mosey, who has cared for it ever since. Mosey was born in 1887. She early became a self-reliant woman and learned the art of farming and cattle raising. She helped embalm the dead, deliver babies, and she learned to make quilts. Oh, I've made a many a quilt, she said. During this time, according to her son Woody, she raised 33 boys and three girls. These she brought to her home from a Knoxville Institute for Homeless and Orphan Children. Of those 36, she adopted one whose name was Woody Williamson. I've bought old relics and antiques from Mosey for many years and found her to be a most shrewd and able trader. As Woody says, she can trade with the best of them. She had a large farm, worked hard, managed well, and was extremely thrifty, and eventually sold her chattels and hundreds of acres and retired to her orange groves near Ochi, Florida. When she learned of the quilt show at the Museum of Appalachia in March of 1983, she had Woody call and tell me that she was coming. Indeed, she did. She traveled several hundred miles, confined to a wheelchair, with her treasured quilt in her lap. The quilt, according to Mosey, was made from cotton and tow, which is a form of flax, hence linen. It is stuffed with cotton. The appliqued pattern is unknown to the author. Homer Sliger's World War II quilt. Every day the fear of opening her mailbox became greater for Betty Sliger during the World War II years. She had two sons fighting in the Pacific and news came often in the community about a neighbor boy who was killed or missing in action. One can hardly imagine the anguish and the helplessness that Betty and a million other mothers felt. As the war wore on, the utter frustration became worse. What could she do other than to write every day and pray? Well, Betty found something else to do. She decided to make a quilt for each of her soldier sons. By so doing, she somehow felt close to them. And the attentiveness and detailed planning required in designing and making these quilts helped to alleviate her worry. One of the quilts was made for her son, Arents, and the other one shown here was made for her son, Homer, who now lives in Sweetwater, Tennessee. It was given to him by his joyous mother when he returned unharmed from the Philippines after the war ended. 
Betty died in 1974, and Homer treasures the quilt even more now. Granny Burke's Dream Quilt James Hooper of Knoxville has an unusual old quilt passed down to him from his great-great-grandmother, Sarah Elizabeth Burke. It was always called the Dream Quilt, James pointed out, because of the story told by Granny Burke. In a dream one night, she saw this pattern, and when she awoke, she drew it exactly as she had dreamed it. Later, she used the pattern in making the quilt shown here. According to information supplied by James, Sarah Elizabeth Gibbs was born in Whitley County and married Judge Wilson, who was later bushwhacked. She then married Dick Burke and moved to Goin in Claiborne County, Tennessee. Sarah is reputed to have made many quilts and to have dyed the fabric with walnut hulls and other natural dyes. Sarah died in her 90s in 1950 near Middlesboro, Kentucky. Her will specified that certain quilts would go to her grandchildren. The dream quilt was left to her grandson, Richard Woods, James Hooper's great uncle, and it was from his family that James acquired the dream quilt. Photograph by Ed Meyer. Quilts and coverlets were sometimes used as backdrops for taking portraits during the Civil War period and into the early part of the 20th century. This picture of Dick and Sarah Elizabeth Burke is a good example. The photograph was apparently taken at the Burke home and the quilt was presumably made by Sarah Burke. She made the unusual dream quilt. Photograph courtesy of James Hooper. Fascinating, fascinating stories of those quilts and the people, and beautiful, beautiful quilts for sure. Such interesting stories, though. I really, really love those. Um, the very first one that we read about, interesting, it was the one that, well, it was one of the first ones. It wasn't the very first one, but it was the one that had the extra piece of fabric over the top, like um, kind of folded over there, and like John Rice was saying it was basted on so it wasn't actually sewed on tightly and that way it could just be removed and changed once it got dirty or once it got worn. Reminded me of course of today we have duvets so it reminded me of that. In those days any kind of washing when you think about washing clothes was terribly difficult. I mean took such a labor and they had to do it weekly but those quilts was even harder to wash. Today we're lucky we have the washing machines we can stuff quilts down in and uh, of course, those old ones, I guess you probably should still hand wash them or something, but such a different time as, as far as how easy it is for us, the ease it is for us today to stay clean and thinking about keeping your quilts and blankets clean. You know, I can take mine and mats off our bed and throw it in the washer and dry it and have it back on the bed that night. You know, it doesn't take no time. But how smart to actually put that, that cover there and that they could, if it got too stained. Now, I'm sure they still washed it. I don't think they just left it on there and got it real dirty, but it, that's the part that would get wore the most because you think about pulling the covers up to you. And um, John Rice is funny, said he was tucking it under little kids' hands or their little chins and their little hands on it, but then even grandpa's whiskers being on it, his beard being out on it. So I thought that was really interesting and interesting that in all of John Rice's investigation and research about quilts that he rarely come across that so that was just fascinating to me Lawrence Stukesbury that quilt the crazy quilt that was really sweet to me because his sisters did it for him really sweet it took them several years but they did it and I'm sure they did it with him in mind you know and then they put his little hand there oh that's so precious really pulls at my heartstrings interesting that um, and then they wrote remember above it. I like that they put those little sayings on it along with the other things they put in their names. But interesting that they, John Rice said nobody knew why they didn't finish it. I wonder if it's just that, you know, maybe as they got older, one moved off, one moved off. Maybe Pearl, the one that was responsible for it, she got sicker and it just never got finished. You know it was probably meant to be finished. It wasn't that they left it out, out on purpose, but interesting to think back to those days and, and wonder why why it didn't actually get finished the teacher's quilt that was really sweet thinking about those kids loving her so much that they wanted to wanted to make a quilt for her hope chest in those days of course their quilting would have been much more common uh, hope chest was more common i'm sure mm -hmm. so it's it's only natural that the kids would have been thinking about that but that was really really sweet that they 
took that upon themselves. Interesting that John Rice asked if they, you know, if they got to do it during school, and she said, no, of course not. We were doing our lessons. I can just hear her. We were doing our lessons then. So we had to do it outside of school, and usually at her house, she said. Um, really sweet, too, that she, she did end up using it and get, got married. By the time John Rice is talking to her about this, her husband is um, bedridden, but they've been married a long time, past that golden anniversary. And then how sweet that she gave it to one of those students' granddaughters, uh, really precious. I really love that uh, for a lot of reasons, just because it's a sweet story. But so often I think about stuff, and Miss Cindy really taught me this when she moved from Black Mountain, and even after she moved here, she just, if she had something, she just wanted me to have, she wanted me to have the opportunity if I wanted it, if Corey and Katie wanted it. If not, she was like, I want somebody to be using it. So she's going to take it to a, you know, to a thrift store, donation center, something like that. But, you know, why, why should I keep it packed up? I should go ahead and give it to you and let you be enjoying it if you want it. And if you don't want it, I should go ahead and ask you and let's let somebody who does want it have it, you know. I really like that. I think a lot of times, um, older people their things don't get distributed like that they just stay packed up somewhere and then maybe it's overwhelming for their their kids or whoever it is that takes over and and then they just end up giving a lot of it maybe they, a lot of it gets thrown away is what i think and that's just sad because there are people out there that would adore the old things uh, not just antique stores and things like that of course they'd be glad to get them but um, I was always the kind of person, even when I was young, I've, I would have preferred something old to something modern. So I think somewhere there, out there, there's somebody that would just adore that stuff that you're having to throw away. So I really love that, that she just went ahead and gave it to them. I really love that. Mosey Sharp, 36 children. She raised 36 children. Can you just imagine how big her heart was and how much love and tenderness she had and, and determination too? Uh, to raise that many kids and that she, you know, oh, I mean, just what a saint you just want to say to, to get those orphans and bring them home and raise them, how wonderful that was. And then so precious that she, she you know, she did very well for herself, John Rice says, and, you know, then was able to sell out all of her, her farm and all that and move to Florida, have the easy life, I guess, an easier life, not have to worry about it. Um, where it was warmer too, I'm sure that was helpful. But then when she found out about that quilt show, she traveled all the way back up here just so she could bring that quilt that meant so much to her that had been, you know, passed down through her family. You can, that's just precious, precious story. Homer's quilt, the one with the soldiers, that's also, all these stories are just really pull at your heartstrings. I know you're like me, you've probably heard, heard stories of uh, mothers who were, uh, their children were off at war somewhere and they were so worried about them and um, so far away from home. Of course, today that still happens. You know, there's still parents of, of uh, soldiers that are having to worry about them. I do think it was different in those, these back then in those days because it was so hard to get news. It was so hard, you know, they have their cell phone like we do today and instantaneous news and all that. But, um, I've, t I've shared this story before in some of the videos, but I'll share it again. It always reminds me of Daddy told me, Pap told me when the war ended. Now, he had uncles on both sides that was in the war. My Papa Wade was drafted, but then they turned him down because he had one leg shorter than the other from a childhood accident when he broke his leg. So he did not uh, fight or did not go to war. He didn't even serve. He was turned down. Anyway, but Pap had several uncles, and so they stayed really in tune to it, you know, really trying to listen to the radio and all that. But he said the when the war had ended, and they didn't know, because again, news didn't travel like that, and at that time they were living over on the Hawshaw, uh, for anyone that's local, on the Hawshaw Road, not at the Hawshaw Farm where Pap was actually born, but um, just down the road from that. Anyway, him and his mother was outside working, and they kind of could see a way over their neighbor, neighbor lady, but she was pretty good distance, but you could see her house. And they heard something and that, you know, noticed that she was outside running around screaming. And he said, uh, his mother said, Jerry, you go over there and see what's wrong with her. You know, you need to go over there and see what's wrong with her. And he said he dreaded it because he thought it was going to be something bad. You know, the way she was acting, that maybe something had happened to one of her kids or, you know, just something horrible. And there he was going to have to go face it. I'm sure probably Mama Marie sent him because she's probably handling babies or doing whatever she's doing that she couldn't go. Anyway. He went, but then it was glorious news. It was that the war was over, and she was 
I, I can't even hardly say it without crying, you know, it's just such a touching scene, but she was running around shouting like that because she had a son, so she knew that maybe he was gonna get to come home, you know, maybe he would, he'd be one of the ones that got to come home living. Um, so anyway, really sweet story, but that makes me think of uh, how precious those quilts were and that, that she couldn't, <clears throat> couldn't do anything for him, like he said, but pray and write letters, but then she thought, well, I can make quilts, and that took her mind off of it. So that was really, really sweet. I love the dream quilt, and especially neat that John Rice said he'd never seen that pattern anywhere else, this there, that's the only time he'd seen it. Now, I don't know if you're a person that dreams a lot. I do. I dream. Most of my dreams are crazy, crazy, but I dream a lot, uh, and uh, my family does too, thinking about it, but sometimes if you're a creative person, things like that will come to you in your dreams. Makes me think of two things. One is that after Pap died, Paul had this dream, and he ended up writing a song about it, kind of this, like, like Pap's whole life going through his uh, dream, showing all the different places of it, and not just the places of it, but like where, how many times he could have, he could have been killed or died, you know, but he didn't. He made it all the way till he did die. But how many times in his his whole life, even from when he was a little child, that he almost, almost, you know, death almost got him. Anyway, uh, and Paul tells the story of it. I'll link to that in case you've never, never heard it or he heard Paul tell the story. I'll link to it. Anyway, really interesting. So it made me think of that. And then it also made me think, it's just funny, if you ever watched Seinfeld, if you ever watched him back in the day, was the one, there's one where, because he knows he's going to think of a funny joke in the night. And then he, so he gets a piece of paper and a pen and lays it by his bed so he can wake up and write it down. And then he writes it down. And of course, he, he don't even know what he, he looks at it the next day. And is like, what? What did I mean? What? You know, in the night, he thinks it's the best joke ever. And then he, he don't know what he meant. Anyway, it's interesting though. She got right up and then wrote it down. Now I've heard, now, like I said about Paul writing the songs. And then I've also heard Pap say that, that things come to him when he was asleep. So that's really, really interesting. And that last little part, the quilt in the photo, uh, I have a picture I'll share. I'll put it here. But if you read The Blind Pig and the Acorn, I shared it recently on there. But it's Granny's family, and there is a quilt behind them. Now, I wish I know, did Granny make that quilt? Did her mother's in the picture? Did her mother make that quilt? Did traveling photographers bring quilts with them to hang up? You know, how did that work? I don't, I don't know. Did they hang the quilt up because they wanted a pretty background? Or did they hang the quilt up like to assist with lighting with the camera, like to block out the backlight, uh, make the people show up better, like give them a background? So I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you know. If you do, please share it in the comments. But really, really interesting to think about that, how many photos you can find. Here's another one I didn't know this was going to be in here. I'd forgot that part of the book, that it was actually here. Or I would have mentioned it when I wrote about my photo on the blog the other day. But I've always found that really interesting, uh, that picture of, I love it, of my, my grandmother and her family, her mother and father and her brothers and sisters, just because it's so old and I love looking at all of them. And of course, I never knew her mother and father, but uh, really neat to see them. And, and then I've always thought about, well, I wonder if that blanket was theirs or if who brought it or where did it come from? So that was interesting. Another one I found really interesting was the Sarah Aldridge quilt. Now, when I first seen that one, I immediately thought of the, if you watched my quilt, my video that I did about my favorite quilts, the quilts in my collection, my personal collection, it reminded me of the one my big grandma made, the baby quilt with the blue and the white and embroidery. Now, big grandma didn't embroidery the wildflowers like Sarah did, but she had embroidered little rabbits and things, you know, thinking about a baby. But it really reminded me of, of that one, so I liked that. And then really fascinating was, you know, when John Rice asked her if where she learned how to quilt because she was, he said she had lived there for 40 years and she had just been quilting a few years, so she was probably an older lady. But she wasn't really, you know, didn't really explain it to him until he asked about her mother. And then when he did, then she talks about being, you know, when her mother uh, and father was raising her and her siblings that he died and how her mother had to raise the rest of them and she was a good manager and how they survived the Great Depression and all that but I really loved the part that she says in the winters when she would make her quilts and that she would uh, she got her material from her brother-in-law who managed or run or owned whichever it was a dry cleaning store and when people wouldn't 
you know, wouldn't pick up their garments, then what's he gonna do with them? I'm sure that happened a lot and he would give them to her and that would be some of the material she would use. I really love that. I love the, uh, the frugal, thrifty nature of it, you know, that she was using something that might've just been discarded. I guess he could have took them to, a, to the poor, to like a thrift store in those days. I don't, not, wouldn't think they had a good will, but something like that. But instead, he gave them to her, and then she repurposed them. I really love that. It's really um, speaks to something inside me, maybe because I'm a frugal person. Now, Matt's grandmother, Bonnie, Miss Cindy's mother, she worked at the YMCA for many, many years in Canton. I've heard people say that at that time she taught half of Canton to swim. But in the same way as the dry cleaner, sometimes people would leave their clothes there. You know, they'd have changing rooms, and maybe they'd leave a sweater or a shirt or whatever it was they'd leave. And the Y would keep them for a while and hope that those people come back the next week and said, hey, I left my sweater or whatever it was. But if, if they didn't come back, then they just had to get rid of them. You know, they couldn't keep them forever. So Bonnie would take them and she would take them and try to find a home for them, basically. Like maybe, you know, it might be somebody in her family that needed them or, you know, this might fit Matt or this might fit my... Uh, daughter Cindy or whatever, but even if they didn't, couldn't use them, she found a, somebody that could um, instead of seeing them go to waste, maybe if they had thrown them away or something. So I really love that, um, trying to find find a home for it. Miss Cindy inherited that from her. She was really good about that. She couldn't stand to see something um, just go to waste. She would try to find someone that could use it. So I really loved that part. And then I liked that the name, the lady's name was uh, Sarah, Sarah, because it's, uh, I've been wanting to tell you about a book and then it just so happens it was written by Sarah, a different last name though, Sarah K. Hermans. It's a beautiful, beautiful book about quilting, also about the stories of the people. So I'm going to read to you just a little bit. Uh, I'll just read on the on the back side here to you. It says, Toward the minister's salary. In the summer of 1903, the residents of Jackson Corners and their neighbors helped support their Methodist church pastor's salary by adding their names to a signature quilt. By looking into their family histories, the book paints a picture of rural northern duchess and southern Columbia counties at the turn of the century when the simple life was coming to an end. It's really a beautiful book. Uh, it's got some photos in it, and then it really digs into those families that actually, you know, helped make the quilt, and uh, really fascinating. I'll put the website where you can purchase the book in the description below. I'll put it right here on the screen, too, so that you could go look at it. But it's just a really beautiful, beautiful book. And Sarah told me that it was really a labor of love for her, you know, really her passion, and that she hoped other people would enjoy it as much as she enjoyed compiling it all. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and fascinating how, you know, why she, why she did it and how the how she ended up with the with the quilt and just the whole story is really fascinating and uh, fascinating how she digs into the history of each person so i hope if you're if you're a quilt lover yeah, you'll check this book out your library or something might have it but again i'll put the put the website so that you can definitely pick up a copy in the same way john rice I love the, because I'm not a quilter, I love quilts, but I can't I'm barely sew on a button. So for me, the attraction of the book that we've been reading is the stories. It's the stories of, you know, Sarah and uh, Mosey and Homer and Lawrence Stooksbury. I was looking at all the ones I wrote down today. It's all their stories and thinking about them, you know, thinking about the Stooksbury quilt there. Lawrence, the crazy quilt that his sisters made, you know, just putting yourself in there. Were they all excited that he was going to be born? Was he the first boy? Why did they not finish out the remember above his handprint? You know, all those things. I just love, love thinking about them. I hope you enjoyed this part of the book. Please leave a comment and share your thoughts and your information, any information you want to share. And please drop back by next Friday so we can see what John Rice talks about next.